So our next speaker, Karen Parker, studies social behavior. Uh, she is also an associate professor in psychiatry and behavioral science at Stanford. This is really easy. I get to just say that over and over for all of the next speakers. Uh, she's also a Cavalier fellow, and she has a particular interest in oxytocin and vasopressin, and as was alluded to, she has a preclinical research program in monkeys focusing on biomarkers for autism and similar brain diseases, but also potential treatments. So, Karen? Hopefully the talk will go more smoothly than my entrance. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so let's start. I'm going to um, talk a bit about the social brain and health and disease and how um, framing our thinking about that will uh, provide critical insights into developing diagnostics to detect autism and therapeutics to treat it. Um, humans, like many mammals, are an intensely social species. We experience, um, from our earliest days, we experience social interactions as rewarding, and the social cognitive skills that we develop in the context of our earliest attachments are critical, not only for survival, but group, co group cooperation and personal well-being. Maybe not surprisingly in a social species, we define illness as dysfunction in social relationships. And so social abnormalities are a hallmark of many brain disorders. And I'll give you a couple examples. So disruptions in social relationships, such as social isolation or loss, are very significant predictors of stress-related depressive and anxiety disorders. And they're also key triggers for substance abuse initiation as well as relapse. For, um, in several disorders like autism, which is the disease that I study, social deficits, are, social deficits are the defining core feature. And indeed, autism is a significant public health concern. It has a rising prevalence of one in 59 US children, and we currently spend $268 billion a year on autism as a country, which is expected to rise to one trillion by the year 2025. And there are several reasons for this. One, autism is, the diagnosis is based on phenomenology, so this is terrific coming right after a meet because you gin this up for me. So signs, symptoms, course of illness. And every time we come out with a new DSM, guess what, we change and you're off the spectrum now. And so. We, unlike other medical disorders, where you would go in, and, and cancer is sort of where we are, we were, you know, maybe we are now where cancer was 30 years ago. Now you go out, you take out the tumor, you, dise you do disease profiling, and then you have targeted therapeutics. We don't have that for autism. So currently, it's a, it's a behavioral diagnosis, um, and um, there are, um, it, so it's a behavioral diagnosis, and, we also don't have any therapies. So the therapies that we currently have are behavioral. They, they can be expensive and variably effective. And we have two FDA-approved drugs, which are antipsychotics that cre uh, treat associated features such as irritability. But we don't have a single drug that targets the core social features of autism. So, Given that we have this $1 trillion problem, how do we go about thinking about developing diagnostics, laboratory-based diagnostics, like the rest of medicine, um, and th targeted therapeutics to actually treat these intractable social deficits? And what I'm going to, and maybe, maybe this is simpler than maybe we thought. Autism is a highly complex disorder. But I'm going to pose the question, can the neurobiology that is critical for regulating social behavior in every mammal ever studied provide key insights into thinking about the biology when social functioning goes wrong? And we have known for many decades that there are two small little neuropeptides that are made in the hypothalamus called oxytocin and vasopressin that are critical for social functioning. We also know that if we experimentally alter these signaling pathways, either through pharmacological or genetic manipulations, we can create social impairments with relevance to autism and animal models. And so I'm going to tell you our translational research story. Because 
autism is a disease of complex social cognition, we felt the need to develop a novel monkey model where our control animals have social cognition, this, the presence of the social cognition. We know that it costs over a billion dollars to bring a drug to market. And when drugs are tested in rodent models, particularly for CNS indications, we see maybe a success rate when translated into human cl clinical trials of about seven to nine percent. And so what we wanted to know is if we created a robust monkey model that had face and construct validity, could we do biomarker discovery to then push forward in thinking about druggable targets and interventions? Okay, so our monkey model was based on the idea that even in the general human population, we see these robust individual differences in social functioning. And so I went up the road to the California National Primate Research Center, which is about 100 miles from Stanford, and there's 5,500 rhesus monkeys there. So we created a statistical classification algorithm, and I'm happy over lunch to go into the details, to identify the monkeys at the social extremes of this population. And um, Again, I can go into the details later, but by using eye tracking and a lot of, by using eye tracking and sophisticated behavioral tests that we developed in consultation with autism clinicians, we've been able to show that these monkeys have deficits in face recognition, deficits in joint attention, and a variety of other behaviors that we would care about in thinking about autism. So we then asked, we perform biomarker discovery in our model. And we simply asked, of the, of the chemistry that we know that's been implicated in autism, in neurogenetic syndromes that have high penetrance for autism, and also just the basic biology of social functioning, could we find markers that would help us differentiate these high and low social monkeys with high accuracy? And the answer was yes. We found um, vasopressin was implicated in this, and that the, low, the monkeys that were the lowest in social functioning had the lowest spinal fluid levels of vasopressin. This was only apparent in spinal fluid, which bathes the brain and spinal column. We don't see this in blood. And we also saw that monkeys that had the greatest social impairments also had the lowest vasopressin levels. Um, so what we, so we, we found this in monkeys, and then we asked, can we go to autism patients and ask the same question? And so we performed a study, and, and I, I kind of laugh and say that the pediatric clinicians run away from me when I show up, because I'm always trying to drag them into my studies. And so I was told, you can't get spinal fluid from autism patients, it's, we just don't do this. And so what we did was said, well, when are you actually taking spinal fluid? And we piggybacked onto clinical indication to get spinal fluid from kids with and without autism. And, and because autism is so prevalent, most people have a connection to it. And so I found an ED doctor, for instance, who I convinced to put hot pink stickers on the LP trays, and then we got paged every single time a kid was there. And some of them had autism and some of them didn't. But what we were able to show in this sample of convenience was that if we just knew the CSF vasopressin level alone, we could predict with high accuracy if a patient had autism or not. And so then what we did is we um, partnered with other groups, and then we, able, we had a much bigger cohort, and we were able to replicate this finding. And what was really exciting in this case is one of the groups was taking lumbar punctures for research indications. So these were healthy kids, otherwise healthy, but they had autism. And it was a part of a big phenotyping project at the NIH. And we were able to show using gold standard autism diagnostic instruments that the lower your CSF vasopressin levels, the greater your social symptom severity. So in terms of next steps, what I should say is the symptom severity, because vasopressin is the social molecule, was specific to social functioning. Another piece of the diagnostic criteria for autism is restricted repetitive behaviors. And so what we're currently doing is doing a targeted protein discovery to see if we can clean up additional noise to actually access that separate piece of the puzzle. And also, as Amit mentioned in his talk, 
think about meaningfully identifying subgroups of these kids. There's a saying in our field that if you've met one kid with autism, you've met one kid with autism. And so the idea of, of trying to see if the biology differs dramatically in a kid that has a little bit of a hard time meeting eye, you know, making eye contact, but is a math genius and happens to work at Google you know, when he grows up is very different than the kid has comorbid intellectual disability seizures and an IQ of 50, right? And so to Meet's point, we want to move to that precision therapeutics. But because most kids with autism are diagnosed at a mean of three to four years of age, that is well past the window where behavioral therapies can be maximally beneficial. And so what we're trying to do, and we have some really exciting data to suggest that in infants who come in for standard of care reasons in bank spinal fluid, in a, in a, I, I grew up in the Midwest, so in the Midwest, nobody moves, right? And so we could go into the medical records at this hospital and figure out which kids went on to be diagnosed with autism and those that didn't. And we were able to predict with perfect accuracy in kids that were just infants, where they had no behavioral symptoms yet at all, who would go on to be diagnosed with or without autism. OK, so we have this interesting biomarker work from both monkeys and kids. And what we wanted to ask was, could we test in a clinical trial, could we do a first-in-class study and give vasopressin replacement, if you will, to improve social abilities in children with autism? And so I teamed up with a clinical colleague in my department, um, Antonio Hardin, and we um, initiated a phase 2A clinical trial that was double-blind, randomized, controlled, um, placebo-controlled, to ask, could we improve social abilities in kids with autism? And I'm happy to say that the answer is yes. We published our paper, um, I think, two days ago, um, and, uh, which was perfect for this meeting. <laughs> Thank you. And this came out in Science Translational Medicine. And so this is one of the first therapies where the primary outcome measure is significant for treating social disability in kids with autism. And what's really exciting is, is clinical trials have a lot of issues, as anyone who's in the therapeutics industry knows. And so you pick a primary outcome measure, kind of like throwing a dart on a dartboard, and you just hope that that primary outcome measure is successful and that you pick the right one. Because if, you, if your secondary outcome measures aren't positive, it's a failed trial, right? And so what we were excited about, but I didn't, we had one measure that was parent report, but what was really critical was to see that we could see this along multiple um, different ways of, of um, analyzing. And so we were able to show that the blinded parents, the blinded clinicians, and the children themselves on a variety of, of divergent measures converged in showing that these kids did have um, social improvement. OK, so in terms of just quickly, lunch discussion. So can an aut is an autism diagnosis in reach? I can talk to you a bit about that. Um, will vasopressin be the first drug that's approved to treat autism? Um, I can tell you a bit about our phase 2B study that's currently underway and funded by the NIH. Um, there's also a little bit of dirty laundry in our field, which is that Roche, um, the pharmacological behemoth, also has a clinical trial, but it's a vasopressin receptor antagonist. So how do we reconcile these two really different approaches to therapy? And then finally, I study oxytocin and vasopressin biology, and we can talk a bit about that. And I just want to conclude by saying that most of this work was funded by private donors and Stanford in terms of our high-risk, high-reward studies. And it was only funded in significant amounts of money by the NIH once it was de-risked. So I want to thank the donors and the Simons Foundation in particular for the early start. <laughs>